Hello all. Welcome to a new episode of Getting to Know NILP. I am your host, Mark Wheeler, Multimedia Production Manager for NILP. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with us, we are the Northeast Independent Living Program, also known as NILP, and uh, we're based in Lawrence. We are a consumer-controlled independent living center that provides advocacy, programs, and services to people with all disabilities of all ages who wish to live independently in the community. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization that receives funding via the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, along with some federal funding, in addition to our own fundraising efforts. Our independent living philosophy states that individuals with disabilities are the best determinants of their own needs and service choices. Through role modeling and peer counseling, we help to empower people with disabilities to make changes in their lives and to become more self-sufficient and self-reliant. At NILP, we uh, really are a community of people who, uh, like our tagline states, uh, we're peer-to-peer -peer resources for people with disabilities. Um, we work every day to create an all-inclusive environment, uh, free of communication, attitudinal, economic, and architectural barriers for all people with disabilities, whether they have visible or non-visible disabilities. Today on Getting to Know NILP, uh, I'm very happy to have as my guest uh, the CEO, Chief Executive Officer of NILP, Matt Pellegrino. Welcome, Matt. Hi, thanks for having me. Okay, it's great to have you here today. And uh, I'm here to get your thoughts and for our viewing uh, uh, public too about NILP and overall perspective of what our organization does and the work we do to serve um, consumers in the community in the region that we serve. Uh, so Matt, uh, first thing I'd like to do if I could is really uh, when I get into uh, your thoughts about running this organization, really, but first, I'd, I would like to learn about your professional history, uh, professional work history, I should say, when uh, you came into our organization as our new CEO. Uh, a relatively uh, few months ago, actually, replacing our former CEO, June Savageau, uh, who retired at the uh, end of this past June and uh, had after serving 15 great years with their organization. So if you could, please tell me about your history and what led you to become CEO of NILP. Sure, well, I started working at NILP in 2006. I actually worked briefly after college at another independent living center. So that's how I, I knew about the, the network of centers for independent living. As you can see, I'm also a, pr a person with a disability myself. Mm -hmm. So I thought um, when I graduated from college, I tell everyone I, I didn't really, at that time, didn't still know what I wanted to do really. I was thinking about journalism maybe. I was oh. thinking about some other things, a history teacher. I'm, I'm a big history um, fan. But I, I, I thought, you know, I know about the different um, system of services for people with disabilities from my personal life, so I thought I would, and I had remembered independent living centers because I had worked with NALP actually in high school as a consumer. So I thought this would be, um, I can I can sort of, I can do this job. So I, I ended up again, I came to NALP in 2006 as a, in our PCA program, our personal care attendant program as a skills trainer, which is, you know, an entry level position at NALP. Um, so I met with persons, and at that time we were much smaller, so I think we only had about 30 staff members at the time, and the, um, I worked in the PCA program, but I also helped persons with non-PCA um, skills training as well around benefits, uh, you know, uh, housing. So um, a, a few years after that, I was promoted to different positions, um, leadership, so a team leader at the time, a senior skill specialist. And then um, we had an opening as with the director of the PCA program. So I was promoted to that position, um, worked in there for a few years. Uh, at that point, uh, that was about six years after to, um, I started at NALP. 
I took sort of a sabbatical, I like to say. I left NALP to see what else was out there. Right. Um, for a few years, I worked in the, um, uh, the managed care organization in Boston um, around disability, but it was different. And I, I really missed the independent living philosophy and, and really our mission. So I, I came back to NALP as um, the director of long-term services and supports, which sort of oversaw the PCA program along with some other programs. Right, right. I did that uh, for, for several years after that. Um, I, I was, June would sort of move me around to the different programs that were starting up at NALP. I worked in the community partner program most recently when we had our low office. So I was there for about five years. Mm -hmm. And then um, obviously June announced her retirement earlier this year. She, she encouraged me if I wanted to, to go for the position. I ended up, at that time I had really low expectations in terms, I thought I would go through with the interview and, and see what happened and sort of learn from that process. But it went really well for me and um, I was appointed as as chief, I, I hate this title. I say it all the time. I CEO. <laughs> um, I think of myself as the director of NALP. So that um, I was pointed to that position in August. Well, that's the title yeah. as it used to be. I, I think in I June's to, I earlier I days, as it, I recall, yeah. then it became evolved into CEO. Yeah, for, yeah, yeah, certainly. Wow, that is just terrific. And I didn't realize that your history went that far back, even to high school and everything. Yeah, as a consumer. And I, yeah. yeah, and I can tell you, I remember when I started back in 2012, you were doing, you were involved with the PCA mm -hmm. program. You were one of the very first people that I met then. And I think even at that time, we only had around 30 people and we're around 100 now. Yeah. So yeah, it's the growth has been incredible. So it, it's great to be a part of this still somewhat small organization but truly growing mm -hmm. over those years and everything it so is. and you're and I'll also say your familiarity with NILP over all these years and our growth you know once I found out that you became CEO uh, it was great I thought well there's no person who knows our organization it could be better placed and suited as you've grown with our organization than Matt Pellegrino that's, oh, well, that's what hit me right away so it's, it's great Great having you as part of that and everything. Um, so Matt, um, to get into the questions I have. So I'm curious because things change. We, from our great previous CEO to your vision and thoughts about NILP as an organization. So as far as being leader of NILP, what is your management philosophy? And uh, by asking you that question, how do you give direction inspire employees that's an important part of leadership and lead and motivate the team sure i think um one of the things as a leader is that you really do have to lead by example you you can't ask the staff to abide by processes or rules that you that you don't um, abide by yourself so i really I, I i try to show up on time every day i try to um really be a presence with the staff so I I, I will I, you know we'll walk around the office I'll talk to some of the different programs right now I'm really trying to get to know some of the programs that I haven't been that involved in in the past um, there's you know I, I, I think of myself as being at NALP for such a long time but you know you can get siloed at times mm. within your program get sort of that micro thinking um, with what you're doing from day to day. And right. so we've always tried in the past to sort of break down those sort of walls between different programs because we're doing the same type of work, um, you know, regardless of what types of services we're providing, it, it's all in the same mission. So, and a lot of times the consumers sort of overlap in different programs. So really it's, it's just communicating with the staff um, communicating with, with staff at all levels of the agency so they can get to know you and I can get to know them. I think when they see you um, being honest and, and, and just being yourself, I think the staff tend to want to work harder for someone that they, that they, that they trust, that they feel um, is valuing their work. So that's what I try to do. Trust is an important part of the process, and it's it's great to hear you say that. And um, I think what you said earlier is absolutely true. We tend to uh, work 
in separate silos, if you will, through our various programs and services, but we're all working towards the same goals mm -hmm. all together right. as an organization. Definitely. So that's, that's, that's really key. So as we look towards the future and our planning and our growth, we do have a strategic plan. And I'm curious to get your thoughts about our strategic plan over the next five years. Um, for you as CEO, what are the strengths, weaknesses, and areas of, of, of opportunity that you envision? And what helps you achieve these goals? Yeah. So I, right now our strategic plan is based on a, a few different areas. Um, not to get too much into the weeds on it, but it really right. is around um, expanding our presence in our service area. So uh, as, as we, I talked about earlier, we used to have a, a, an office in Lowell. We ended up um, sort of closing that for different reasons, but we mm -hmm. wanna sort of expand into, the, into those cities outside of Lawrence. Um, we, we've been in, our headquarters has been in Lawrence for as long as I, I believe the agency has existed. Um, but in, in sort of that, because of that, your consumer base is, is very heavy Lawrence um, in the, and consumers in this area, but there's Lowell, there's Havel in our service area, there's Newburyport. Um, these are all areas that I think we're gonna look at really getting back to and seeing what works for our consumers mostly. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how does our presence help them in that area? How can we make it more convenient for them to meet with our staff? Mm -hmm. uh, we've taken on more programs over the past five or 10 years during, during June's time and that's caused our service area to sort of even expand outside of our normal ILC service area, which is, you know, generally the Merrimack Valley, but mm -hmm. certain programs do require us to go outside of that, you know, more onto the North Shore, um, down towards Boston. So it, it can, it, it's helped us expand our presence with consumers, but it also can be tough on the staff um, to, to travel out there. So oh, yeah. we want to look at different ways that we can um, make it easier for our staff to provide services to all the areas that, they, that we provide to, as well as what, what works for our consumers and what they need in those areas. So that's one part of the strategic plan. Um, another is around the recruitment and retention of staff. Um, it's, it's been tough for everyone, I think, over the, since the pandemic especially. Um, this is a tough field for, for staff to work in. It, it, it's, a high burnout rate because of, of the type of work that we do. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's, we're looking at different ways to, to pay competitive wages um, within our industry and, and really benefit packages for staff that make it um, incentivize them to stay with us and see NAOP as a long-term career as opposed to maybe just starting out in the in the field you know to gain experience in and then move on to other things mm -hmm. so that that's something we definitely want to do as well and then also we're looking at our IT infrastructure and operations to see if we can uh, make make services more efficient um, for the consumer and make again going back to the staff make it easier for them to do their jobs by with some of our technology that we have so th those are some key areas of a strategic plan. Um, it's not going to be easy. Some, you know, sometimes you set goals and the reality sets in, but I, I think we can achieve a lot of those, particularly uh, around serving underserved populations and expanding our service area. It can be challenging work. I, mm -hmm. I know that all too well because you want to give the best uh, localized work in the communities that we serve. Definitely. And it varies from con consumer to consumer on their individual needs. It can get very intense and you want to serve them the best you can. Mm -hmm. And technologically, that's important too. And, and just to get through the pandemic, we certainly had to adapt, adapt and be flexible and try new ways of meeting and serving our consumers and let alone having the communications with each other that were required. Yeah, that's so, a great point. And that's, yeah. some, that's just one way that it's changed in the, in the past three years. Just, it used to be you're doing conference calls all the time. Now we're, we're still seeing, we're seeing people in person, but not in the same place. So, um, right. but we can use that technology for a consumer that can't maybe make it into a, a center that if we can't make it out to them for one reason or another, and, and uh, you know, Mark, we used to have a policy in place or a, a procedure where we would close down 
um, when it was when it was heavy snow in the area. Oh, yeah. Now we can because our staff would have you know be danger for them to travel out into the community. Now we can we can continue working from home um, in a way, so we wouldn't have to lose that day. So that's just this is one thing I know. Not to get too much into the technology, but I know um, <laughs> it's important. Yeah, so it's good that you're going over this. Yeah, and, and some of the staff in the past, you know, we take out our notebook and paper and pen, um, but now we can we can take out a laptop to the home and and, and look for services um, with the consumer on the computer with them. Um, these are all things that things have improved in the past four or five years at NAOP and. Um, I shouldn't say thanks to the pandemic, but it's really forced us to look well, at things differently. Yes, we all had to learn and adapt, yeah. and thankfully um, we've uh, come about very well exactly. through all those areas doing that, so, so that's terrific. Um, now, Matt, I wanted to get a little bit into uh, fundraising and everything. Of course, we receive funding, but to serve all the consumers and more that we'd like to, our fundraising uh, uh, certainly helps us a lot. Um, Obviously, one of our big events is we have an annual golf tournament, which helps us, and we do other things to help fundraising. So please tell me about your feelings about fundraising overall and the importance of that for NILP. I, I'm really curious about what do you feel are the keys to successful fundraising in your estimation? You know, it's, fundraising is so, it's important for a nonprofit. But I think it's been it's been a challenge in NALP because I don't know if centers for independent living or independent living centers, but however you want to call us, have a great sort of um, I don't know if we're well known out there as a resource in the community right, as we should true. be. Um, we always say we're sort of a hidden gem um, in terms of our services and 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 what we do we, we we don't usually have a lot of eligibility criteria for our services if at all um someone just has to identify as a as a person with a disability and and they can re generally receive services from us so i think that's different than a lot of other organizations out there that might have more stricter um, eligibility criteria so um another director was was telling me um uh, recently that you know, in the, when you say independent living center, the response you sort of get from people is, oh yeah, I, I know what that is. I, I just put my grandmother in one of those um, a, a little, you know, that's that's not what we do. Um, where it, it might be a better way to sort of brand us as a center for independent living. So we, we are, uh, as you said in, at the opening, an advocacy organization at heart that assists people with disabilities that live in the community, in their homes, when we, we don't have residences, um, we don't have, um, it's not a place where people live, it's, it's really an organization for peers, uh, mm -hmm. people with disabilities, um, over 51%, helping other people with disabilities accomplish their independent living goals. So I think, back to your original question about fundraising, Mark, I think a lot of it is that we just have to tell our story and how unique we are to, to those that are, that are willing to give and show our success stories. And I, I think, you know, we don't want to be seen as a charity. We're, we're, right. We want you to, we want people to think, yeah, we like what they're doing and we want to be a part of that. So that's really, I think, if, if, if I can do that, you know, over the course, as I go along here in the leadership role, that's what I'm going to try to do. And hopefully that'll, that'll pay off. That'll be great. I think our message and our of all the successful consumer stores that we have, that's the best way to tell about mm -hmm. the work we do um, to the communities that we serve. And what you said about independent living is so true. That's become such a co-opted mm -hmm. phrase. It could mean anything from retirement homes and so forth. So it's kind of a word where the intention where independent living center was made people have kind of taken that term and used them in other directions so there is some confusion out there so yeah and you know we want people to live in the least restrictive environment that right. they're choosing that's really what it's about you know if that's an assisted living um that someone wants to go into that that's fine but it really we're looking to keep people in the community if, if at all possible and i think part of that is a lot of people aren't educated on the service that are out there, not through any fault right, of their own, right. but because it's just, it's not a good um, outreach system probably. And I think um, part of our job is, our staff's job, and regardless of the program they're in, is to teach people about what's 
um, resources and services are out there so that they can make those informed decisions um, and, and, and they can know if there's an equivalent service in the community that, that they might be, you know, go into an, a long-term care facility to receive when they could receive it at home, like the PCA program, mm -hmm. like uh, adult family care. These are programs that, that really help people live in the community and remain, remain there if possible. And it's really, we spend a lot of time in advocacy and educating our consumers too. They may not know all the resources no. that are available to them. So we help guide them through that whole Absolutely. process too. So um, what you just talked about um, really kind of is part of the next question I'm asking you about, because these are the things you like to do to convey the message about the work we do. But to be a leader, and what qualities do you think are required to be a successful leader for NILP? I think uh, at NALP, at any place, I think a leader is someone who's willing to listen to others, willing to not always be the smartest person in the room. I think it's sort of a, um, a misunderstanding that someone who's a director or someone in any management position is always the expert on what, on, on what they're managing. Uh, you know, you have to listen to others and, and hear their perspectives. And um, I really try with the directors at NAOP, we have a great team, we have a great staff mm -hmm. to really l listen to what they think will work because they're the ones um, that have boots on the ground. I think, you know, my background as being a direct service um, worker for many years can sort of um, help inform my decision making um, when it comes to how we're structuring our services and, and also as a consumer myself. Um, I think that's very important. I, I think that's a strength of mine um, as a leader at NALP that, that I, I've, I've seen the services from all angles as a consumer, as a staff, as, as a manager. So I think that's what I try to do um, in terms of my leadership. But I think, you know, honesty, integrity, all those things that, you know, that you right. think of in a leader, right. I think would, is, is, is good for NALP and, and, and any leader out there. I think it's good to what you said too, to really be open to the possibilities to uh, get uh, different people uh, with the staff and their perspectives sure. and everything and come up with a thought because there may be new directions that maybe mm -hmm. didn't have to thought about, but at least you're open to the possibilities and entertain what they say. And they may, and I'm sure there's great ideas that come out of that too I as a result. So. I definitely think so. Yeah. Yep. Oh, that's terrific and everything. And then part of that in the decision making, uh, we do have a board of directors. And I'd like to get your thoughts about this, about the importance of uh, having a board of directors and how that helps toward uh, uh, working for the success of NILP. What do you see, Matt, as uh, the role and value of the board in your success as CEO? Well, our board in particular is one that has to be 51% persons that live with a disability. And that's, that's, I believe, unique to our, you know, Centers for Independent Living. And I think that means that there are stakeholders in our, service here, our services. Um, it's, we're not putting a lot, of, you know, we're not necessarily putting people on our board that have, you know, strategic partnerships with us like other organizations. We want, pe we want our consumers on our board. Um, we want people who understand how important our services are to, to the lives of people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, if that's what I'm, I'm gonna take anything from the board in their direction, it's that, it's that these are people who really, you know, truly understand because of their lived experience, why um, Center for Independent Living are so important to, to the disability community. So I think that's, um, they've been great, so supportive of me since the start. You know, I, I, I had some contact with the board um, previous in my oh, previous yeah. positions, mm -hmm. but not too much. And, and I think certainly I'm getting to know them and they're getting to know me a little bit more um, than just the interview process. But I, I think so far they've, they've had some great su suggestions about about um, the way our operations, and, and I'm willing to listen, as I just said in the previous answer. Like right. I listen to all um, perspectives on it, and and I know that they I have their support. So I, I think I think it'll be a, a great symbiotic relationship 
<laughs> I couldn't agree more, and I, I think it's important to note, as you pointed out again, that the board, like NILP, it has to be a minimum of 51% of people with disabilities who are part of that process, too. And it's also important that uh, the board members really reflect the communities that we serve in the population, I think. Yes. Really to have that perspective Absolutely. on that side as well. I think that's important. Um, so you've been with NILP for a long time. And uh, this is kind of a question, maybe I hope it's not putting you on the spot. What's one thing, or maybe more, that you would do differently for this organization that may have not been done previously? You know, um, no, that's not easy. That's a tough question. This, yeah. is why they, this is why they call you Mike Wallace at the office. Mike. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah, I want to know. <laughs> then sweat on the upper uh, lip and so forth, as Mike <laughs> Wallace used to do in those 60 minute interviews. No, I think, um, I, you know, I don't want to uh, repeat myself, but I definitely think if we can uh, do better with the outreach um, for NALP in the community, and I know one of our programs, is, uh, many of our, several of our programs, but one in particular I know has been monthly taking their staff out to visit with different community organizations, um, sort of I look at as our partners because a lot of times we're working with a lot of the same people for different things. Um, but sort of introducing us to them and them to us about what our services are. And I think that is one way, you know, that'll help us with the, with the uh, getting people to understand uh, what an ILC is. Just like they might know what a, a nursing home is or what a, um, an elder service provider is or um, the, the ARC system. Mm -hmm. I think um, g getting them to know what an ILC is is, is something I want to I want to do through our programs, through outreach. Um, you would, we're sort of looking at our uh, our presentations that we can do to make them better when we're when we're just talking with different partners in the community. So that's one thing. I also think you know I'm working with a longtime employee, Jim Lyons, mm. and um, our vice president of advocacy and, and community development, um, to really develop relationships with our local politicians and leaders. Um, so that they can help us in a way um, and, and, and attend our events and get to know our consumers and staff um, so that we can assist them if they ever have constituent outreach, but also they can assist us um, with, with our funding priorities and things like that. So I think those are two areas that we, you know, we've, we've tried in the past, but we, we definitely want to prioritize, I think, moving forward mm -hmm. um, so that we can, that we have a seat at the table when it comes to the, the lot of changes that are happening in the health um, care delivery system oh, yes. these days. Yes, and I think what you said, uh, first of all, it's very important to go out and, uh, and meet other community organizations and meet the people there too and really get the word out about the work we do because mm -hmm. you're right, it's just getting that message and maybe not as many people as we would like know about us. So I know, for example, uh, our community supports team getting to homeless shelters to talk to the staff and the people there, just to letting them know about it. Yeah, and that, and you know, I think when people think of different areas like housing, like benefits or like vocation, they might think of certain places. Right. Um, but we do it all. You exactly. know, we really do it all at NALP. Um, we we are. Uh, we receive a lot of referrals from different housing agencies to help take some of their, their consumers um, that are having difficult times, particularly those around disability, either around accommodations at their residence, uh, modification funding for assistive technology in the home. We're also doing housing search. Um, housing um, the transition is a core service of ours, um, the transition from a facility, a hospital, back into the community, helping um, consumers purchase furniture. So I think those are, um, it, it's, it's getting people to understand our services and what we're doing um, and see us as a resource like they see others in the, in the community, I think is something that's important. That's so important and yeah. it's important to, uh, so all our viewers know too that we truly serve the entire population, all economic strata all across the board. Um, we're not focused on any particular disability, exactly. across disability organizations. So. Um, 
that, yeah, it's important to say thank you for saying that, Mark. Yes, <laughs> we will help guide uh, uh, our consumers to the kind of services they need, whether sure, it's through we, us or, or it this, may be elsewhere, yeah. but we will find that help that they need. I Absolutely. think that, that's so key important. And just so everybody knows, all our services and programs are free. So that's, that's also important to note that our, our viewing audience may not be aware of. So Yeah, we, I just want to mention that when you were saying um, if we if we can direct them to other places, we have a partnership with um, Age Span, which is a, mm -hmm. a well known elder service organization in the Merrimack Valley and the North Shore. So that there's sort of a no wrongdoer policy. If if they receive a referral that they think can be helped better by NALP, they'll do a warm transfer over to us. Mm -hmm. We're very familiar with the staff at Age Span. Oh yes, um, good friends of ours. So um, that's that's just one way that we can sort of provide that information and referral if needed, um, which is another core service of us. And that's just one area when you were talking about them. Uh, they do say, serve the aging population for the most part, but we serve all ages, certainly mm -hmm. that to very young ages, yep. to all ages, Absolutely. really. So that's important. So Matt, I wanted to ask you, and, and this happens often with CEOs, they often find themselves working the rooms, so to speak. Uh, or networking at a gala event, so forth and everything. What is your personal approach for those kind of situations? I know if you were to sit there and describe our entire organization, what we do, that can be tough. So how do you condense all that when you're maybe meeting different people and put it in a short thing? Yeah, I don't know if anyone would, uh, this is, <laughs> would see me as work in the room. I'm, I'm sort of, I think people, I'm a man of, of uh, What's it called? A man of few man, words. Man of few times. words. Yeah. Um, but it's it's something I'm trying to change a bit in this new position. Um, I have to be a spokesperson for NALP. I do. I've always done a lot of listening to others, um, but usually less talking. But I think one of the, uh, if you had to condense our message, I will always bring up the fact of our our staff that are peers, that our board are peers. This is not always the case for other organizations that are providing services um, to the same demographic that we do. Um, and I think when you, I know this for myself as a direct service worker, when you go out to someone's home and you're using a wheelchair and they're using a wheelchair, you have that instant credibility that, uh, that other human service workers unfortunately don't have. They might have great intention, they might be really uh, great at their job, but they don't have that instant credibility that a peer would have when they go out to their home and say, yeah, I know, I know how you're feeling. I know what it, how difficult it is to get your wheelchair fixed and work with these insurance companies and, and who, are, who are hassling you and because they don't have an authorization or your, your doctor didn't send something over. Um, we understand how that feels to be without really your legs for a, a week or two. Um, so I, I think that's, that's what I tell, that's what I plan on telling people if they ask about NALP and, and really pushing that, that sort of um, theme that, that right. we're peers, that even if, you know, even on some of our staff who, who don't necessarily have um, a disability or a visible disability themselves, they have, they often have close family and friends. Um, there's a reason why they got involved with NALP in the first place because they do have that close contact with someone who has lived experience. So I think that's really what I would try to sell in a way um, if, if I were, you know, talking about our organization to others. Right, and when you're talking to people out there too, it's just an intro line and just, well, this is kind of basically what we're about, but you want to open the door for any questions they have, which Absolutely. you can tell them everything about what we do. Yep. And as far as um, the peer connection, that is so vital important, and that's when you can truly work well with a consumer. If, if you have a disability as well, or you have the experience of somebody in your family, or uh, somebody you know who has a disability, mm -hmm. you can get that. Um, I always think of a great example of William who works in community supports at our agency. And he was talking uh, to, with a consumer on the phone and everything. And that consumer, particular consumer, was a bit skeptical. It's kind of like, well, how do you know about me and my disability? Mm -hmm. And William invited him to come in and meet with him and so forth, and he did. He came in and, and as soon as he saw that William was blind, all the 
skepticism melted away. He just saw him as, here's a person with a disability. He can understand what I may be going through. Yeah. And he related to him right away, very well. And they had a great relationship from that moment going on forward. Too. Yeah, and uh, the so. unfortunate part is a, a lot of, of consumers in the disability community have had ne negative experience with the healthcare field mm, for true. one reason or another. And that's sort of informing their thinking when someone else is coming out to their home. But I think you're right. I think um, that the, you know, seeing a peer, seeing someone who understands their situation and they know that they do, mm -hmm. um, I, I think that makes a huge difference. Makes an area of comfort for them, and they mm -hmm. can that the fact that they can relate and really talk down because we're building relationships with these consumers too, and making yeah. them work. And it to can take a while them. to do that. Oh, absolutely! It's not an easy process. Um, it's not always happened the first meeting. Um, they need to. We need to build that trust with them. So that takes a long time, and when you work with a consumer, for example, to uh, get into housing options, that can take a long time to get them uh, to the place they should be absolutely. and want to be obviously. could be a years long absolutely oh, abs yeah no doubt about that okay so matt um you've been really thrust in this position <laughs> as a ceo i'll say that because it changes and all of a sudden you're you're uh, shouldered with all these new duties and everything so obviously you're very busy as a ceo that's more than understandable i really want to find out how you feel personally about controlling your own time how do you manage uh, no doubt your very busy calendar <laughs> That's come on. I don't know if I have an answer for this one yet. Like, uh, <laughs> Not yet. It may come <laughs> apart. Yeah. It's been um, it's been four months, but it's been it's it's very it's very busy. Um, just you know, you're you're working with a lot of more staff than you used to. They they want um, they want your time in, in the, to sort of talk about um, their priorities. So it's been tough, but I I do really try to keep that. You know, not to speak in cliche, but a, an open door policy at the office. Um, I want the staff to know that they can, if I, that I'm available to them, that I'm accessible, that I'm, I'm, you know, transparent with information as much as possible. So I think uh, I don't know if I figured that out, Buck. I, I, I guess you know, you, you look at what your priorities are and you try to fit them into your day and then take on everything else. But at some point, you know, I'm I'm hoping to really empower. The directors. We have a great leadership team. Yeah. We have a great staff, um, but certainly they're the experts on their programs and, and what works. And I'm gonna let them um, a lot of times do their thing um, and provide oversight to that, and and try to use my role um, to look at some of the bigger picture things going on with the organization and what how we can go forward. But uh, it, it's it, it definitely there's only so many hours in the day and i, I feel True. like sometimes i'm working more than that um <laughs> yes but, i understand uh, it, it's um i think i'm settling into a groove and i know i'll feel a lot better in a year from now in, in terms of that and other questions that you have than i do right now <laughs> okay <laughs> well i know it takes a while to get acclimated to but I, what i like is your vision of it mm -hmm. and really kind of a level playing field for all you're open to everybody uh, discuss that you're very approachable and yeah. we can discuss anything that goes on and everything and I know in my past I used to work for a couple places where they're you know the the chief people are up on a pedestal and it was tough to approach them and everything but you're just open to everybody and everything and that I think that leads to the whole spirit of NALP that we've held as long as I've been with the organization for 11 years and yeah it's great to continue that and even make it better so no certainly and even you mark i've been getting i've been probably interacting with you more in the past couple months than we have i mean around the, the our, our sort of image out there on the on the social media so just really getting trying to get involved in all the different aspects of the program um i think is is that's that's how i'm going to learn the most um, about areas that maybe i didn't know as much and and what you do and what with, uh, you know, different persons that are uh, uh, staff at our agency. So I'm looking forward to it. That, that is yeah. terrific, because I'm in the realm of marketing and yeah. development. That's important of how people view us mm -hmm. and how the public sees us and so forth, and to get the word out. We talked about early in this interview. In fact, we were called, I think, right around the time I started, and I think there was only around 30 people, the best kept secret in the Merrimack Valley. Thankfully, that has changed considerably. <laughs> Yes. And I think our people are, have gotten to know us that much better, and they will continue to get us to know each better as we get out in the community, 
uh, through all the methods that we've already discussed. Certainly. So, yeah, yep. that is terrific. So we have a lot of uh, diverse array of programs and services that we offer to consumers at NALP. Uh, what's your assessment of it overall? Is that we really serve all needs? Is or is there more? I don't know if there's a, ever to say we can improve in, in areas. Mm. Um, I think something I always, whenever I'm either interviewing new staff or talking to others about, um, I'm always explaining that our programs have the same mission, which is to keep people with disabilities in the community. You know, the, the RLC, um, the recovery learning community that we have, might, might do more sort of su uh, support group model, um, you know, groups out in the community. Other programs might do more direct service, one-on-one um, -on -one work in the, in the home, but they all have the same goal. Um, some might put in place a PCA program, some might help someone to search for housing, but really it's, you know, how can we make you, uh, help you um, achieve independent living goals in your home, in the community, close to your friends and family and not isolated somewhere in a, in a, a long-term care facility. So I think, uh, I think all of our programs right now, you know, share that mission. Um, I also think that we're sort of trying to get involved in different more managed care, um, mm -hmm. with managed care uh, organizations and partnerships with them, which might not, you know, always have our IL philosophy in mind, but if we're in with them, if we're at the table with them, if we're on the care team, we can sort of change that, change them from within. That's ideal. Change that paradigm you know, in the getting in the mix that way. And yeah. I hope we can be successful in that. So I think even those programs which might go a little further from our, our core services um, and maybe have that, you know, we want to talk about our IL model to their clinical model and, and we think ours is better and we can oh, we yeah. can sort of help inform your workflows and your um, your care model to, to more align with independent living philosophy and self-direction and consumer control. Um, so I think that's why um, we're, we're really trying to aggressively become um, involved with these partners in, in the healthcare world so that we can we can bring our vision to them. Right, and in essence, we're educating these Absolutely. Uh, them as well about that too. I'm also happy you brought up the RLC, the Recovery Learning Community. Um, in fact, the Recovering Learning Community, um, we have housed in our independent living center, of yeah. the 10 independent living centers in Massachusetts. We're the only one that houses a Recovery Learning Community. Specifically, it's called the Northeast uh, Recovery, uh, Recovery Learning, Recovery Learning Community. Yeah. community. And they really help people who, uh, deal a lot with what one may call invisible disabilities, mental health challenges, uh, uh, things of that sort and so forth. So that is great. Yeah. So uh, Matt, my last question to you too, and it's kind of a philosophical question and everything when you think about it, because you haven't been in this, this CEO role all that long. What do you feel is the best part and, and also maybe the worst part of being a CEO? <laughs> Well, I think uh, I have to say the the worst part. I don't know if I, would, but I would say <laughs> the the best part is if you're uh, you're in a position to certainly make an impact um, like you've never been before. I think, and I think uh, to sort of combine it, with maybe what the what the part that makes me the most nervous is that. Um, which I should call the most challenging The most part. challenging, let's just Rather that. than worst, I think that <laughs> probably is better uh, terminology. But I think you realize, uh, you know, I've realized since August that I'm now sort of really responsible for the entire organization, its history, its um, the staff and their livelihoods and decisions that you make could affect all those things. Mm. So, and that, and that wasn't always, you know, I was, I've been a, a manager and a director for many years now, but you know, you're in charge of a team of people and it's, it's, you know, you have confidence over that and expertise in that and you feel, you, you, even if you made uh, a, a poor decision, you, you wouldn't think like it would affect uh, a great deal, you could fix it, but I think um, being the exec uh, director of NALP, uh, you know, it's a, it's a heavy burden uh, mm. to take on. And I know June used to talk about 
how there's sort of a heaviness to you know you're always with you you're you're sort of on call um you know you you you're always working when you're in this position so i think it's but it's it's a it's a generally an honor um to have been appointed as the the director of NALP it's something i take incredibly serious our history and and really moving us into a um a great place in the future so um you know there's uh, i'm really excited about it above all else that's why it's great now i've always felt that way yeah. about you personally that that's how you like to look at it all too and everything and you're right when you say uh, uh june like it's what she used to say about it being heavy and i remember june talking about she would be in the shower and just a thought would come to her because uh, it yeah, always is these kind of things yeah, are always, always kind of weighing yeah. on you right so yeah. yeah that's what i think that's what i mean by always working you always sort of <laughs> exactly. even when you're at home watching a television show with your <laughs> wife and oh i have to do that thing tomorrow and it's it's always <laughs> something but Think, exactly yeah. there's always something <laughs> all right well thank you matt i really enjoyed our conversation today and i certainly feel that the viewers you've learned a lot more about nalp through uh um through talking to matt here and everything so i thank you for that i i really believe that you covered a lot of ground about your thoughts and running this great organization and the consumers that we serve so thank you for uh, taking the time to do this with us today um, no doubt that you have the vision and leadership uh, to help make us a bigger and better organization to serve all the communities in our coverage area in Northeast Massachusetts. So for our viewers, uh, thank you everybody for joining us on this special episode of Getting to Know NALP. Uh, please note that you can call us anytime at 978-687-4288. And also, please do visit our website at www.nilp.org. You can also find us on our social media platforms, including Facebook, X, formerly Twitter, and also on LinkedIn. Thanks again, everybody. Look uh, for us again on another future episode where we will spotlight another one of NILP's programs and services. So uh, have a good day, everybody.